So as I mentioned, right, this is where the video is going to kind of pick up is we've swallowed the food, we've swallowed the liquid, whatever it happens to be, and it goes from the oral cavity down to through the pharynx and eventually enters into the esophagus. There we go. So once it enters into the esophagus, now it has to travel down to the stomach. All right, so remember, the, the process by which that's going to happen, right? The esophagus undergoes something called peristalsis. That peristalsis is what kind of causes this pinching. Right. Right. Specifically, the circular layer of muscle is what causes that pinching. And now you can see how from here to here, right, that kind of pinch segment has gone from here and it's you know basically gone from this level and it's all the way down to here right what caused that to happen were the longitudinal muscles so again the the um the circular muscles cause that kind of pinching inwards motion it's the longitudinal muscles which actually then pull that bolus down towards the stomach. All right. Now there's a number of different structures and features kind of of the esophagus, right? One of the things, the esophagus is exposed to a great deal of um, kind of friction, right? The other day, my son started just crying. It Well, call me a terrible person. I found it kind of funny. It was funny. He, uh, my son is, is uh, what's the word? Um, he is definitely uh, prone to injury, but they're not even injuries. The other day he was cleaning up something and he stubbed his, uh, I mean, granted, I, I mean, I stepped on a Lego and I thought I was dying. So, I, I mean, I saw Jesus. I was praying and, you know, I'm an atheist. So, I, no, just kidding. Anyways, um, <laughs> The entire purpose, right, of the esophagus, right, when we think about bringing that food from the, right, the mouth down to the stomach, there's a great deal of kind of friction. There's a great deal of kind of abuse that the esophagus has to take, right? What I was going to kind of get into was, you know, talking about my son before I got all religious there for a minute, um, was, right, he had a chip. He was eating a snack, and all of a sudden he started kind of crying. Well, what's going on, buddy? He said, like, oh, the chip hurts so bad. I was like, ooh, you went, went down sideways. He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, that's the worst. And that's the thing, right? When we chew food, well, if it's a thing of chips, something hard, right? Even if we grind it up, it's still pretty, like, abrasive, All right? So if you took sandpaper and just, like, rubbed it against your skin for, I don't know, 10 seconds, 10 seconds isn't a problem, but... After a minute, it's going to start to get kind of sore. Well, when we eat, we eat for a hell of a lot more than a minute. Right? So, we eat throughout the day. So, our esophagus has to be able to withstand a pretty significant amount of kind of abrasive, frictional force. So, there's some, some structures or some features. The way it's designed kind of helps permit that. And that's what we're going to kind of look at here in, for just a minute. So we can see the lumen. Right, the actual opening, right, way up here at the top. This is where the actual food, right? I'm going to draw a little, I think it was a Dorito E8. So I'm going to draw kind of a triangular thing. That's a Dorito. Yeah, that's not, that's not terrible. So we've got to have a way, and really, you know, the, the best designed epithelium for this, we see, right, stratified squamous epithelium. Right, stratified meaning multiple layers, squamous meaning the kind of these flat, regular shaped cells. And when you build them together, you build them in layers upon layers, they are make up this wonderful barrier. Right. And that's what the uh the esophagus is actually lined with. Now as we go a little bit deeper, right? A little bit deeper to again, uh deeper to the epithelium. We start to get into what's called the lamina propria, and then just beneath that. That's where we get into something called the muscularis mucosa. All right, the muscularis mucosa, don't confuse that with, oh, you know, don't think of that as being a part of the muscularis layer, right? We've talked about the circular layer. We talked about the longitudinal layer. Those are the layers which actually help to um, 
help to propel and move the food, not the muscularis mucosa. All right, so don't don't get that confused. All right, you can see the thickness. I mean, the entire thickness of the esophagus goes from essentially here all the way down here, and I don't know half here all the way to here two-thirds anyways right two-thirds of the thickness of the wall of the esophagus is muscle right and that's because it takes a huge amount of muscle to move this food down into the stomach right and again that's you know that's part of why the design of the esophagus is the way that it is and we can see right this and this is kind of a cross-sectional um, take the esophagus cut it from the top down and then look at it well, you're looking at it from the a superior view this is what we're looking at all right the adventitia again that's just like the think of that as being like the, the outer covering like the leather jacket if you want to call it that right the adventitia but this in through here right this is all muscularis layer right this is all muscularis layer you can even see right i'll kind of draw a line Not gonna tr well, I'll try a little bit more. Well, I'm finding this rather therapeutic, so maybe I'll just go all the way around. Oh, that one got a little sloppy. I, I, I got cocky there for a minute. I'll stop there. But you can see, especially right in through here, you can see it really well in through here, right? As far as the the grain of the muscle, I don't know if you guys remember from way back in 121, but when we don't, when you want to talk about like how muscle moves and and the um you know the direction in which muscle contracts so let's look at the fiber direction right like, how the hell did i tell i can't tell the fiber direction here well do you see the fibers here nope right so if you don't see the separations that means they've got to be running this way here you can see kind of down the cracks and crevices that means these five these uh, muscles have to be kind of coming straight out at you right think of a Grab a bunch of straws, right? Take the, the handful of straws and turn them sideways so you're looking at the entire length of the straw. That's this. Take those straws and then turn them so you're looking kind of from the top down. That's this here. Right, does that make sense? Right. Anyways, um, the lumen, right? This is where the food would actually be. Right, this here. This is where the food would be, right? Food, liquid, whatever it is, right? The mucosa, all in through here, right? This is what, right out and through here, right? This layer here we looked at just a second ago, right? Up and through here, right? This is the stratified squamous epithelium, right? The stratified squamous epithelium. So, all up and through here. Okay. So, same thing, just another histolo you know, just another histologic image. Again, we see the stratified squamous all up and through here. Same thing in through here. Right, all stratified squamous epithelium. We can see the lamina propria from here to here. We can see the muscularis mucosa from here. So essentially here and then basically from kind of here all the way out that's all just muscularis um, layer now this here i want to just ask a question and, and not talk for a minute which you're, maybe you're jumping for joy you're like oh man praise jesus well wait, wait, wait. I'm getting all religious. Praise whoever. Just think. Thank you for not speaking for a minute. So I'm going to just pose this and then, then, then ask a question. Or I'm going to ask the question and pose a question and then stop talking for a minute. What am I looking at? Okay. Oof. Kind of fell asleep there for a minute. 
So, this here, this is stratified squamous epithelium. All right. But, man, we got something weird. Something weird's going on. Well, remember what we're leading into, right? Eventually, we're going from the esophagus into the stomach. So, I take that box and then blow it up. Hey, that's what I'm looking at. Right. This here is stratified squamous epithelium. That's a part of the esophagus. This here, right, this is all columnar epithelium. You're actually looking at the stomach here. So this is that, that, esop you know, that esophageal, that gastroesophageal junction, that junction where the esophagus meets up with the stomach. That's why we see this transition of epithelium. The stomach would not survive, right, if it were composed, if it were lined with stratified squamous epithelium. Right, the entire purpose, um, the stratified squamous epithelium is meant to resist, right, uh, abrasive frictional forces. That is not the intent of columnar epithelium. All right. Within the stomach, there's a number of you know gastric juices, uh, hydrochloric acid, for instance. Stratified squamous epithelium is not, you know, not composed, is not uh, devised. It's not created to function that way, to protect in that capacity. And part of the reason why is because there are a number of different glands that you can see in um, glands and cells, um, something called goblet cells that you see throughout columnar epithelium. These goblet cells can actually produce mucus, right? There are some throughout the esophagus, as you know, they're called esophageal glands. Um, but as far as the amounts that you would need in the stomach, simple columnar epithelium is a much, or not simple, but a columnar epithelium is a much, much better epithelium to see in the stomach because of the fact that it's a much more, you know, a much more of a kind of chemical irritant or kind of a chemical um, war zone, if you would, more so than an abrasion, you know, abrasion. Now, they're absolutely sure. There, there's abrasive, you know, uh, kind of frictional, you know, food particles in the stomach, absolutely. But And that's part of the reason why, right, the epithelium in the stomach, I mean, within a week, right, 10 days, usually about every seven days, um, the lining of the stomach is completely anew, right, has regenerated itself. That's how much kind of abuse, that's how much repair it, it's required, is that it's regenerated about once a week. So it's it's pretty significant. So here we're looking at the, you know, parts of the stomach, right? This kind of layer here, or this, uh, really this kind of hash mark here, that could actually be even kind of looking at what it was we looked at here, kind of this junction through here. But we see the different parts of the stomach, right? When we think of kind of like the head of the stomach, if you want to think of it that way, right? Like this whole thing here, right? That's something called the fundus. The fundus. That's the, that's, again, it's not the head, but it's the top portion of the stomach. That's the fundus on through here. Down here, right? something called the pylorus right this kind of this last portion of the um of the stomach right pylorus there's a couple there's a uh, structure called the pyloric sphincter we'll look at it in a second so where's the fundus is here Ooh, that's awful right this middle part being the body Right. This here is the um, the pylorus. Right. Now we can see the different muscle layers. We see there's one right kind of going this way, another one going this way, another one going this way. There's actually three different layers of muscle on the stomach. 
right? There's the, um, again, there's the longitudinal layer. There's the circular layer. And there's the oblique layer. So this really kind of achieves two things. One, the, the stomach needs to be able to mix, mingle, right, to intertwine, make sure that all of the different foods that you've swallowed can mix with the different gastric secretions which are produced via you know, or that are produced in the stomach now the other thing that the muscles can do is not all the food in our stomach is going to digest the same right think of it if i eat a all right toast and butter that will open up a thing of wonder bread and just loaded that puppy up with butter. If I did that, that white bread being a very simple, you know, being a simple carbohydrate, that butter being, you know, you know, predominantly fat, pretty much all fat, right? That fat is going to take a much slower or a much longer amount of time to digest. That slice of white bread, it's going to digest and within 35, 40 minutes, it is already on its way into the small intestine. Right? So one of the things having these multiple muscle layers are able to do is it can the stomach can actually almost kind of compartmentalize, right? That lipid kind of stays up here on top of the fundus. Meanwhile, the carbohydrate being that slice of white bread is already down on the pyloric sphincter already down on the pylorus having been digested and then once it's on route into the duodenum in order to do that something called the pyloric sphincter has to relax right the pyloric sphincter that's the quote unquote the valve right which allows food to go from the stomach into the duodenum again the duodenum is that first part of the small intestine Now, one of the things that we can kind of here we can see it a little bit, but we see kind of some of these little kind of twists in through here. Those are called rugae. Those are called rugae. The stomach are the stomach is filled with different rugae or not different rugae, but they're filled with rugae. Think of them as being like little folds or ridges. And our stomach is not always the same size. Right? Um, that's evident on Thanksgiving where it's, you know, eating is more so a competition as opposed to like just eating because I want to, right? Thanksgiving, it's like, all right, I'm going to see how much, you know, I'm going to try and out eat my, my uncle. I got one uncle who like, pre I'm pretty sure, right? There's very few people in existence that can go into a buffet and the buffet actually loses money on them. That's my uncle. Right, this man looks at eating as a challenge, right? So sometimes they we eat a lot, sometimes we eat not so much. Right? We don't always need to have this really large, you know, stomach, so therefore it contains these rugae, and the rugae can you know stretch out to allow for expansion of the stomach if we've consumed that much food. Right? Now, two other things which um forgot to, to mention. The greater curvature, right? These are just kind of two uh, areas of the of the stomach. The greater curvature here, and the lesser curvature here. See, I forgot to point those out a minute ago. And again, here it's just a um, just an actual kind of uh, cadaveric, an actual gross model of the of the rugae. You can see they're quite large. Right, they're they're well, they're very large, really, right. And as we eat more, so the stomach can begin to stretch. As it stretches, again, it stretches and stretches. The rugae flatten out. Excuse me. As the rugae flatten out, um, again, when the full when the stomach is distended, the rugae have pretty much all but disappeared because that's their intent. As the stomach, you know, stretches and distends, the reason it can do so is because of the rugae actually stretching out. Happy, healthy, normal rugae. Man, thing of beauty. Whew, look at those puppies. Man, they're looking good. Looking good. 
So as I've been mentioning, right, the, the stomach, there's different gastric secretions or different gastric, um, you know, I've been calling them gastric juices because look, literally you're, that's what you call them. Um, <clears throat> but there's a number of different secretions which the stomach can produce. There's hydrochloric acid, for instance. There's pepsinogen. There's the hormones called gastrin. There's a an abundance of mucus that the stomach is going to produce. Right? It has to produce all these things, right? The uh, hormone gastrin. That helps to regulate car uh, yeah, cardiac function. Good Lord. That helps to regulate digestive function. Right, we'll, we'll really more, we'll talk more about that in lecture. But gastrin is a hormone which can help to produce more hydrochloric acid, for instance. Lining this, you know, the wall of the stomach. So we just take a snippet and we kind of blow it up. This is what it looks like. Right, all these kind of pits, just like this. Right, I'm just going to jump for a second. Right, scanning electron scope. Right, this is literally. What we're looking down into into this pit if i could shrink myself small enough and jump down into this pit i would eventually you know walk along a parietal cell a chief cell a g cell these different cells which produce these gastric secretions but yeah that pit that little hole you're just looking at that's right here right and you can see these cells all line those different pits So we see surface mucus cell, mucus neck cell, parietal cell, chief cell, gastric glands, G cell. Yeah. We see surface mucus cell, mucus neck cell. There are several cells which produce mucus, and it makes sense. Right? We have to have an abundance of mucus coursing the stomach. Right? It, hydrochloric uh, oh, there was there there's a video. Um, it's from The Simpsons, actually. It's a great video. Really should find it and upload it. But there's a, an episode where uh, Homer is at this like carnival, I think, and um, he goes up to this. I think it's like a chili cook-off or something like that. And he goes up, and um, this guy says, "Oh, nobody can eat my chilies." And Homer touches one of the peppers to his tongue and he just goes ballistic, screams, it's super hot, you know. So he Homer's running around, he finds this candle and he takes the can he takes the candle wax and he drinks the candle wax. And then he, you know, realizes, oh man, with this candle wax and my you know, coating my tongue and coating my throat, I I I can't feel the heat of the pepper. So he goes back to the guy and then Homer proceeds to eat like 20 peppers and, you know, starts to have this you know, psychedelic hallucination. It's really a great episode. But my whole point is that candle wax coated his mouth, coated his throat and prevented the pepper from, you know, the spiciness, the whatever it is, to, from coming into contact with his tongue. Same exact idea here. All the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. If we didn't have sufficient levels of mucus produced in the stomach right that's where we can start to develop ulcers like peptic ulcers or stomach ulcers right and those can be immensely painful why oh you take uh, you go and you know let's say scuff your skin up a whole bunch so it starts to bleed and then take some lemon juice and dump it on there you know, let me know how painful that is right and lemon juice has a ph of around five stomach acid is around 1.5 so Stomach acid is significantly, significantly stronger and more acidic than lemon juice. All right, so that's why there needs to be a huge amount of mucus which is produced in the stomach. That's to counteract the amount of hydrochloric acid which is produced. All right. We see some of the other cells, right? The chief cells, right? The gastric glands, the G cells, the parietal cells. Right, I guess I'm, here we won't really talk about those too much in um, in lecture. We'll definitely talk more about what those do for sure. But down here we can see, right, the three different glands, the three different or glands, excuse me, the three different layers of muscle. Right, we have the oblique layer, the circular layer, and the longitudinal layer. Right, that's different than in the uh, the esophagus, for instance. Right, or even later on we look at the intestines. Right, there was just two layers there, circular and longitudinal. The stomach has a third layer, and that is the oblique layer. 
So again, you can see they're they're listed here as far as what they can you know what they secrete, right? The mucus cells obviously it's pretty right, pretty obvious what they secrete. The parietal cell, right, being stomach acid, chief cell, G cell. I, like I mentioned, this is more these here um, in, in lecture they're going to be covered quite a bit, so that's why I'm not going to belabor the point here. Um, and no, absolutely not. Will I be expecting you to be able to you know differentiate? Oh, that's a mucus cell. Oh, that's a parietal cell. Hey, that's a chief. No, absolutely no, definitely not. Do you need to know? Do you need to know that this is a gastric pit for sure? Right. Do you need to know that that right there is a mucus neck cell? No. All right. So, I'm food. Started in the mouth. Left the mouth, went to the esophagus. From the esophagus to the stomach, stomach. Now it's time for me to enter into the duodenum. That is the first part of the small intestine. Right, the first part of the small intestine, that's the duodenum. That's right here. The duodenum eventually wraps around, and the duodenum eventually feeds into something called the, the jejunum. That's the second part of the small intestine. The jejunum wraps around, 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 and then at the very end, right, the last, the last portion of the small intestine, that is the ileum. Right, so the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. The middle portion is the jejunum. The third portion is the ileum. Now, one of the things, you know, all three share a lot of the same structures, a lot of the same, you know, appearance, or I would say similar appearance. However, there are you know specific differences in each of them. This is in the small intestine. You can see it almost looks like these little finger-like things sticking up. Yep, there is. These are called villi, right? There's a villi here. There's one, two. That was off. Three, I mean, there's fourth one, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's a number of villi. Same thing over here. Villi, villi, villi. Those are seen throughout the intestine, right? Some are a little bigger, some a little bit smaller, right? But the villi are seen throughout. In the duodenum, down here, Right. These are all <clears throat> duodenal glands or Bruner's glands. These you only see in the duodenum, hence duodenal glands. Huh. Right, these things here, 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 right. all these things. Those are all duodenal glands. You only see them in the duodenums. If you see those, you know, oh, I am in the duodenum. Or the duodenum. The, the, the one thing about the duodenum, right, the, we talk about absorption, digestion of food. Um, at this point, there hasn't been a great, sure, we've taken the food and we've kind of broken it down from this large, you know, large chunk of food I had to, you know, pull out of a bag put in my mouth and then grind it up with my uh, molars or with my teeth but even as small as that you know food has gotten in your mouth it really has not digested a, a terrible amount right and the reason why i say that is 80 or, 80 or so percent of digestion occurs in the duodenum right so the, the bulk of digestion the bulk of uh, absorption occurs in the duodenum So again, we just kind of see some more, you know, some more of the villi, kind of how elongated they are. Right. One of the things with the the villi is they are going to function to increase the surface area of the intestines. Right. Similar to the um, saliva, I mentioned we have to kind of mortar and pestle the um, the food we've consumed, so we can actually, you know, because if the enzyme or that that saliva doesn't come into contact with the food 
that saliva can't actually break down the food. Same kind of idea here. If the nutrient, if the lipid or the fatty acid, the amino acid, whatever it is, if it doesn't actually come into contact with the, the wall of the intestine, which is what I'm outlining here, then you can't actually absorb it. So in order to maximize absorption, our intestines have, you know, our intestines, our small intestines have this appearance with the presence of these villi. So that was the first portion of the um, the small intestine. The next portion is something called the jejunum. <coughs> Excuse me. Now you might say, yeah, this looks pretty similar. Yeah. Yes and no, it does look similar, but when you look at the size of these villi and the duodenum, right, they are significantly shorter than that of the jejunum. The jejunum, they are very long. They are very pronounced. Right, very, very long, very thin. Right, something else that we're going to see in the jejunum. Well, minus... One thing we don't see, right, here in the duodenum, we saw all these Brunner's glands. You do not see that here. And like, oh, I see this big white area. Yeah. It's this big white area of nothingness. Good lord. Let's slow down. Right. If you look through here, you don't see any sort of Brunner glands whatsoever. You don't see any of them. So that tells me I can't be in the duodenum. Had no choice. Got to be somewhere somewhere else. Now I see really long, thin villi. So I think I'm in the jejunum. There's something else here we don't see, which also is going to help you figure out that we're in, that we're not in the ilium, that we're not in the duodenum, and that we are in the jejunum. But before we get to the ilium, right, something about the jejunum, the circular fold, or something called plica circularis, these, this is like an actual macroscopic um, image like this is like a large, you know, you, would, you can clearly see these with your own two eyes. This is not magnified. Right. These folds are large. They are very, very large. Right, very large. The plica circularis are like, Think of them as being like macroscopic or giant villi. On each one of these plica circularis, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of villi. Right? This is one of the ways, again, to maximize the surface area. If we increase the number of folds in the intestine, we can increase the number of villi. If we increase the number of villi, we can increase the surface area. I can hear the circular folds right here. Now, one of the things with the villi, right? So, if I, you see, over here you can't see it, but over here you can. You see how, like, surrounding this villi here, right? Even this one here. If you look, this actually, I'll use this one. If you look kind of there, right, it looks kind of hazy. And the reason why, villi, each individual villi is actually covered with what are called microvilli. Whoa, good lord, yeah, micro, right, thousand, there's these villi, which are microscopic as they are, are covered with microvilli, which are even smaller yet, just another way to increase the surface area of the intestines so we can maximize the, you know, the absorptive cap uh, capabilities of the intestine. And again, the, and that's that's seen throughout the the small intestine, the 
ilium, the duodenum, the jejunum, right? That's seen in all three different parts of the small intestine. These here, again, these, these cells, what these cells are going to do, these are cells you're going to cover in, um, in lecture, right? Kind of a Cliff Notes version. When we look here, right? Goblet cells, we mentioned those before, they produce mucus. Like CC, or CCK, cholecystokinin, right? GIP, secretin. Dif these are different hormones which help to regulate hormonal secretions as it relates to digestion or helps regulate these different um, dige uh, yeah, digestive secretions as food traveling from, for instance, the stomach to the intestines, for instance, um, or from the intestines to the jejunum, right? So that's where these particular cells are going to help to release those hormones or release those digestive secretions, excuse me. So this next slide, right, this is just, I mean, this was, again, on a scanning scope or a scanning electron microscope. And we're talking about a, you know, a serious amount of magnification here. This is looking at those individual villi up close and personal. Right now, we're talking about how close here we can actually see, uh, see food kind of covering over top of the villi. So, again, that's the entire purpose of these villi is to maximize the surface area so more food can come into contact with the villi because again the more food that comes in contact with the villi the greater absorptive ability of the intestine and that's just what we're looking at here is why i put that on here this here is the ilium this is the third part of the small intestine now one of the things that we start to see here now, sure, you can still see villi. Now, they're not as clear cut. They're not as as kind of prevalent, not as pretty as they were in the, right, for instance, the jejunum, right, or the duodenum. But really, the big difference is this stuff. Man. I haven't seen that stuff at all. Yeah, those are called payers patches. Right, those are called payers patches. We see solitary lymphatic nodule. Yeah, the mole. Well, way back at the beginning, when I talked about mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Right, we talk about right lymphatic tissue in the intestines. Right, or immune tissue in the intestines. Right, we've all seen commercials. We've all heard, oh, you got to eat yogurt. It's got probiotics. Or you've got to eat whatever, kombucha or drink kombucha. Because, you know, if you can stand the stomach, that stuff, oh, man, you're, you're set for the apocalypse. Because, good Lord. Yeah. But probiotics, right? There's all these normal, happy, healthy, very beneficial bacteria which colonate the intestine right now there's also bacteria in the intestine that is potentially harmful right it could be potentially pathogenic it's normal however if it flourishes or grows too much ah now it's a problem right there are certain bacteria on the body right the skin like staph aureus right for instance Another, uh, or one of the bacteria in the actual colon, right, or in the small intestine, um, is C. diff, right, Clostridium, uh, Clostridium difficile. It's a normal bacterial strain. It's supposed to be there. Right? It becomes problematic when it over flourishes, when it becomes too out of control, right? Part of what is in the intestines to help kind of regulate any sort of you know pathogenic growth of bacteria is this lymphoid tissue again these payers patches I mean these you see in the ilium right these payer patches you see yes there is lymphoid tissue throughout the intestine however these payers patches specifically you see in the ilium so if you see payers patches we know we're in the ilium if you see 
right? No pairs patches. If I see no duodenal glands, I know I have to be in the trigenum. Or if I see really long, slender villi with no duodenal glands, I know I have to be in the in, in the trigenum. If I see kind of short, fat villi, but a whole plethora of duodenal glands, like I see here, or down here, then I know, well, I must be in the duodenum. This here, this is, we talk about, right, the, the uh, microvilli, right, on the villi themselves, right, here's the villi, these little tiny things, right, we can see here, scan electron scope, 80 magnification, to see the microvilli, we're going to see here in a second, we have, stop it, 8,000 magnification, right, so we're talking a huge amount of magnification, Right, in order to be able to see this. Right, see how small, right, think of it. This here, this is one cell. This is, this is part of a single columnar cell. And there are literally hundreds of, vil, of microvilli across it. That's how small microvilli are. Right. This is where, like, this is like the nitty gritty. This is like the area where food and all the, well, at this point, it's not called food. It's, it's name changed a while ago. Um, but this is where all those nutrients and particles come into contact. And they essentially make their way th through the microvilli and eventually get reabsorbed into or get absorbed into the bloodstream. Now we look at that. All right. When it gets absorbed into the bloodstream, yeah, it, what, whatever it happened to be, right? Fatty acid, uh, carbohydrate, um, uh, protein, I enter, travel through, enter into the bloodstream. Awesome. Now, depending what I am, right, some fatty acids, medium chain and large chain fatty acids, all large chain and most medium chains, don't actually enter into the bloodstream. They enter into the lymphatic system. From the lymphatic system, they travel all the way up, all the way to the subclavian vein. And from there, they dump into the venous system. All right, so they actually bypass the bloodstream for the, you know, for upon initial absorption. Part of why, right, the nutrients are absorbed in the way that they are, right, amino acids, the uh, monosaccharides, or those simplified carbohydrates when they absorb into the bloodstream the first place that they go to is to the liver right your liver is unbelievably important when it comes to adjusting the composition of the blood especially from a um, amino acid, a lipid profile from a glucose standpoint, right? Your, your liver even detoxifies, even detoxifies um, certain medications, hormones, right? There, there are certain medications where, let's, let's imagine, oh, the therapeutic dose is a thousand milligrams or whatever, right? They actually have to give you an additional you know, an additional amount because of how efficient the liver works at breaking down the medication, right? This is why, take, you know, Tylenol, ibuprofen, whatever it happens to be, right? This is why you can take certain medications, oh, once every four hours or once every six hours. That's how quickly either the liver, depends on what medication it is, uh, either the kidney clears it or how well the liver you know, metabolizes it. So that's, you know, these, your organs can metabolize these different nutrients, these different medications, the different amino acids, the fatty acids, the monosaccharides, which are put into the body. Because again, the first place that these things go to is up to the liver.
So, from the <coughs> excuse me, the small intestine. Right? Really, the small intestine is where right the vast majority of absorption and digestion occurs. Right, as far as absorption of nutrients. Really, in the large intestine, there's not a great deal of absorption of nutrients which occurs. There's some um, production of nutrients, right? Butyric, butyric acid, vitamin K, for instance, um, they're produced in the um, in the large intestine. But really, the most important kind of function of the large intestine is the absorption of water. Right? Any water that remains in right the you know that remains in the stool at the end of the line is going to get lost right we're going to defecate it into the toilet tree right on a buddy's windshield not that i've done that maybe more than once anyways um right that's the entire purpose of the large intestine is to reabsorb i want to say the entire purpose that is the main purpose it has several other functions which are very important absolutely However, one of the major functions of the large intestine is to reabsorb any additional water, right, that the body might need. So it's important for proper motility of the large intestine to occur. Right, just think of it. If, you know, let's say instead of moving, you know, I don't know what the actual pace of movement through the intestine, but let's just call it miles per hour, right? Yeah, instead of instead of moving five miles an hour through the the large intestine, the stool is moving at one miles an hour. Well, if the stool is moving more slowly, that means more water, right? If this is the stool and it's moving more slowly, moving more slowly, more and more water is leaving the stool and getting reabsorbed into the body. So for that stool gets harder and harder and smaller and smaller and slower and slower. As that happens, more water, more water is absorbed into the body. So therefore, you can just see that's you know something called constipation. The opposite's true if let's say, you know what, man, uh, I just had some Taco Bell and this this stuff is just running through me, right? If it's just running through you, that means they're there isn't sufficient amount of time for that water to be reabsorbed. So the fact that there's just a, a small amount of water that's reabsorbed means the, the stool remains kind of liquidy, and that's where you have diarrhea. Right? There's a balance between the two, where right? you want it to be middle of the road. So this thing here, that's something called the ileocecal valve or the ileocecal finger. That's an ilio, ilium, cecal, cecum. This first, let me get these right. This first kind of opening into the large intestine is something called the cecum. This pouch right here. That's something called the cecum. This right here is something called the ileocecal valve. This is the valve which, op which opens up, which allows food to go from the ileum and dump into the large intestine, specifically the cecum. All right. So from there, there's some kind of structures that we, we're going to point out. We see kind of these segments. Right, for instance, like we see this segment of large intestine, this segment of large intestine, this segment of large intestine. Those individual segments are called postra. Think of them as like compartments. This line right here, all the way through here, we see it here, we see it here. These are what are called the tenia coli. The tenia coli. The tenia coli. Right? Same idea. Right? We have you know, the movement of peristalsis we talked about in the esophagus. Again, the, int the intestines do it as well. But, but one of the things about the hostra is it literally kind of acts like a little pouching. Right? And when the uh, intestines kind of 
you know, move, let's say here's the stool, right? So each individual hostra were to shorten. As this hostra shortens, the stool moves forward, right? And then the tinea coli is able to pull the stool to the next hostra. As the hostra shortens, the tinea coli shortens as well, and you can just envision how, all right, the stool just kind of progresses along that path, so on and so forth. So it first progresses up along the, um, traveling up the ascending colon, Right, all the way up. Then eventually it will travel across the transverse colon. From the transverse colon, it will then enter down into the descending colon. Now at this point, this is where we start to enter into what's called the sigmoid colon. If you kind of look like right in through here, it kind of forms like an S. Yeah. All right, a hazy kind of S. That's called the sigmoid colon. That's called the sigmoid colon right in through here. Right, it went a little far, right? But really, this is all part of the sigmoid colon, right? Running through here, but down and through here, this is where we really start to get more into kind of rectum, the anal canal, right? As opposed to the sigmoid colon. Sigmoid colon is kind of right back in through here. But here's the rectum, right? Don't worry, I promise I'm not going to say this, the, the phrase that everybody says when you hear the word rectum. Um, This is kind of the last stopping ground, right? Stool doesn't just generally hang out in the rectum, right? It's not like stool just hangs out in the rectum and then all of a sudden, I got to go. Generally, you know, stool, hang, well, excuse me, not that it's not like stool is hanging out, but you get my point, right? Stool is generally, right, before the sigmoid colon, once, like once, you know, stool reaches the sigmoid colon, you are definitely getting some, Oh my God, I'm going to, you know, my pants, like I got to go. So once that happens, then there's this, what's called a mass, you know, mass put, you know, mass, post, mass, per, mass peristalsis, which essentially just sends the stool down the line. In lecture, you guys will talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that process here. Okay, here's the anal canal, right? Rectum, anal canal. Um, two sphincters, right, which function to regulate this movement, right, or this kind of uh, exit, right. This is the internal anal sphincter right here, internal anal sphincter, and then here we have the external anal sphincter. The external anal sphincter is voluntary, right, I meaning you can consciously control this. This is like, Oh man, I got to get in the urge to go to the bathroom, but I'm, I'm in the middle of class, so ugh, I'm going to stop myself. That's the external anal sphincter, which achieves that. This here is the internal anal sphincter. That's involuntary. This you don't have any conscious control over. So once stool, right, once that defecation reflex is triggered, your internal sphincter has begun to relax, right? Your external sphincter has taken over. Right, so it's this the the marriage between the two of these is what prevents you from you know just walking around campus defecating everywhere. So which is a good thing. Two thumbs up to that. So throughout the you know throughout the large intestine, right? Whether it's the ascending, descending, transverse, sigma, doesn't sigmoid doesn't matter. Right, it looks a lot like this. Now similar kind of sort of really if anything it looks more like the stomach than it does the um than it does the um duodenum or the you know intestines but you can see right these intestinal glands they kind of look like gastric pits a little bit not a lit not a little bit a lot of bit remember we see goblet cells remember goblet cells are going to produce mucus cool All right the, the function is different, Mark. Right? remember, I had mentioned the purpose of the small intestine is to maximize the surface area so we can maximize the digestion and absorption. The, the intestines, the large intestines are different, right? They have to produce various vitamins. They have to produce certain fatty acids, right? Their function, yeah, they have to reabsorb water, but really, I mean, as far as other nutrients, it's minuscule. So there isn't this massive, massive amount of, of, um, of 
digestion or absorption that has to occur in the large intestines or just isn't. So therefore that's why it doesn't share that, you know, microvilli, villi feature that you see throughout the small intestine. Again, we can see them through here, right? Going on. Right, same thing. Again, muscularis layer on through here. Again, like I mentioned, right? You can see, I mean, like you can see, I mean, there, you do see the presence of these kind of almost, you know, these finger like structures here, right? In the slide previously, we saw the microvilli, right? But we don't see, right, this big abundance of villi. Right, we just don't. We don't need to see them because we don't need to maximize the amount of absorptive ability of the intestine, of the large intestine, excuse me, the large intestine. So one of the things that we do see a huge amount of, kind of where we're looking is if we, I look, let's say, let's try that again. If I look kind of like right in through here, if I blow it up, we see a huge number of goblet cells that are present. Huge number. That's one of the ways we know we're looking at the large intestine. There are nowhere near this many goblet cells throughout the small intestine. But the large intestine, there's a huge, huge number of them. Huge number of them. Right, and as I mentioned, right, the vast majority of absorption is going to come through the small intestine yeah i mentioned the the primary responsibility of the large intestine is to reabsorb the water but that still pales in comparison to small the small intestines absorption of water right this here this picture is just kind of all of the fluid we produce on a daily basis right we look at it saliva All right, one liter. Ingestion of liquids, two and a half liters. Gastric juices, two liters. Bile, one liter. Pancreatic juice, two liters. Intestinal juice, you, have to, you do not need to memorize these numbers. My whole point in this is that when you look at this, right, let's imagine we ingested and secreted 9.3 liters. 9.2 liters is absorbed, right? Because think about it. All the saliva... All of the gastric juices, all of the different secretions from the pancreas, the secretions from the small intestine. Like saliva, saliva is like 99.5% water, right? Gastric juice is the same thing. I mean, it's not quite that high, but I mean, it's 90 plus percent water. Same, I mean, many of these different digestive secretions, the bulk of them is just water. I mean, talk about soda. Right, soda is like ninety plus percent. Water. Well, not quite ninety percent, but I mean the bulk of soda is water. Same thing with milk. Right, milk is essentially just water, with a bunch, you know, a bunch of other molecules and stuff. So I mean, water makes up the bulk of of these different um, compounds, these different solutions, these different uh, d d secretions, and the vast majority of it gets reabsorbed. So unless you're losing large quantities of water. You know through sweating and things like that it's really not necessary to drink you know some people oh man i drink a gallon of water a day it's like okay you know if it depending on the climate you're in depending on you know what sort of issues you have depending on the reason why okay right but for just the whatever routine office worker who is at a desk in ac for most of the day Oh man, I gotta drink my ten glasses of water. It's like, well, that sounds like an arbitrary number, right? Where'd that ever come from, right? Who said you need eight glasses, eight eight ounce glasses of water? Who's, you know, why is it you need half a gallon of water a day, right? Your body absorbs, reabsorbs most of the water that it utilizes. Um, so again, obviously, if you're exercising and utilizing great deals of water, okay, that is you know much different for you, but for the average person, it's really kind of silly.